The Russian bear is on the march, or so Russian propaganda would tell you. To say the war in Ukraine hasn't worked out like the Kremlin was hoping would be putting it mildly, and one key element of the Russian war machine is almost completely missing in action. Why is the Russian Air Force not being utilized in Ukraine? At first, it seemed like Russia was going to rout Ukraine. After all, one was a former military superpower with the world's largest supply of nuclear weapons, and the other was a nation that had been through a lot of political upheaval and had never been tested on the battlefield. The power differential was so big that most people assumed Ukraine would be overrun within weeks and that NATO nations on its border might be next. But then, something happened after almost six months of fighting. Ukraine's military, bolstered by powerful and modern weapons from NATO, struck back and started taking back one conquered city after another. People waited nervously for Russia to strike back, and then it didn't happen. Russian forces fought bitterly and many retreated. After all, the Russian military was understaffed, under-equipped, and filled with draftees. Russia continued to pound Ukraine with missiles, but Ukraine has gotten well used to the procedures of sheltering from bombs during the early days of the war, and the missiles could only do so much damage. Russia lacked one key element which would have made these strikes much more devastating – precision aircraft that could deliver a devastating payload behind enemy lines. Ukrainian forces watched the skies, but nothing seemed to be coming. Why did the Russian Air Force go missing at this key moment? Russia's main problem is that its air force was designed for a very different war. Russia's air force dates back to pre-revolution days when the Soviets had their own powerful program designed for a possible World War III with the United States and its allies. Much like their nuclear program, it was invested in heavily and then barely used because Russia's military conquests didn't require the use of an air force. Most of the invasions the Soviet Union successfully pulled off were to their west or the countries of Eastern Europe or to their south in the resource-rich but lightly populated Central Asian republics. They pushed further south to Afghanistan, but they only found trouble there, and most of their influence outside Eurasia, in places like Cuba and Vietnam, was largely political rather than military. So, the Soviet Union never faced a major air-based conflict, leaving Russia without the experience it needs to conduct itself in such a conflict. Russia's air force is old-fashioned, in every possible way. Much like Russia's nuclear weapons, most of its planes are of Cold War models, and that means they're still based around Russia's Cold War doctrine. As the Soviet Union's power base was an ocean away from the United States, its air doctrine didn't place a focus on fighting for air superiority against the West. The goal of the Soviet Air Force was largely to provide support over key fronts, taking out enemy ground forces while backed up by ground-based air defenses. They're critical for scouting and other missions, but odds are that the best Russian airplane would lose a one-on-one -on -one dogfight to the best US fighter jet, and it wouldn't even be close. Because it's not just the plane, it's the pilot. Odds are that the man behind the cockpit of a US fighter jet will have lived and breathed that plane for a long time. On the other hand, a Russian soldier behind the cockpit might be, well, just a regular pilot. They lack the specialized training to gain air superiority and the specialized aircraft to maintain it and help their troops on the ground. The US has a whole line of aircraft designed not just to dominate the skies, but to take out ground-based air defenses. These SEAD aircraft, also nicknamed the Wild Weasels, are completely absent from Russia's military. And the results speak for themselves. During the early days of the war, the Russian Air Force was pounding Kyiv, and Kyiv was fighting back thanks to NATO-provided aircraft and ground-based air batteries. Countless Russian aircraft went down in flames. Although, when asked to provide exact numbers, Russia responded, Nyet. Not only were these very demoralizing losses, but they were very costly. Airplanes are among the most expensive parts of any military assault, and it seemed like the Ukrainians had their number. So when the assault on Kyiv faltered, Russia changed tactics and started focusing on consolidating their gains in the east, even annexing some areas under widely condemned sham referendums. These holdings were largely kept under control by ground troops and vehicles. After all, you can always draft more troops, you can't draft more planes. And then, when the Ukrainians turned the table, no one was sure what to expect. There were large Ukrainian battalions coming for cities that Russia claimed, and Putin was boasting that any attempt to take back the cities would be an attack on Russia itself. So why weren't the planes bombing the forces coming for cities like Kherson and Kharkiv? Because the Russian Air Force really isn't an air force at all. Russia has powerful and fast planes, sure, but what they lack is the high-tech intelligence gathering capabilities that the US planes have. Russian planes are essentially just airborne artillery. They're sent on bombing missions based on intelligence they're handed by their commander, and they deliver the payload with very little initiative on their own. Unlike US top flight teams, they're not able to hunt the enemy independently. 
And with the Ukrainian forces, that is a big problem. The Ukrainian forces have proven much more savvy and resilient than many expected, and they're known for their highly effective battlefield maneuvers. They've successfully psyched out the Russian forces more than once, most famously in the city of Kherson. This was one of the cities that Russia had annexed, and no one was sure if Ukraine would even attempt to take it back. But using the highly accurate HIMARS rocket system provided by the United States, Ukraine targeted supply bridges to the Russian efforts, cutting them off from critical supplies. Ukrainian forces then massed near Kherson, causing Russia to rally to defend it, and then attacked and liberated the city of Kharkiv instead, cutting off another key supply source for Russia. Russia found itself outnumbered in Kherson, and soon that city was lost as well. And based on initial intel from commanders, the Russian Air Force likely would have bombed the wrong target and made the situation worse. But the problems with the Russian Air Force don't end there. Many of the Russian planes that enter Ukrainian airspace don't come back. Kyiv reports that its military shot down nine Russian warplanes in a two-week period in August and September alone, and at least five of those losses have been confirmed. Russia remains tight-lipped and Ukraine isn't giving away operational details either, but it's believed the weapon responsible is a German self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, meaning that Ukraine isn't even risking its own planes to take the Russian ones out of the sky. But the Russian Air Force didn't remain grounded. A few weeks after those losses, they were back in the skies pounding Ukrainian cities. The Russian Air Force was mostly targeting stationary Ukrainian positions, mostly in the country's east. The targets were largely areas of Ukraine that Russian forces had recently abandoned essentially trying to make Ukraine's recent gains uninhabitable. Would it work? The initial attack on the small liberated city of Sperna saw two strike aircraft accompanied by a drone dropping unguided bombs delivered via a parachute. The Ukrainians decided it wouldn't be worth shooting them down and just retreated, and it wasn't clear if any valuable targets were hit. Other Russian Air Force hits have been successful, but maybe not as successful as the alternative, because there's one major problem with the Russian Air Force that might put the final nail in its coffin. When these planes enter Ukrainian territory, they have to brave the NATO-provided air defenses at Ukraine's disposal. When those planes get shot down, not only are the pilots in danger, but million-dollar aircraft wind up destroyed or behind enemy lines. That can mean Ukraine winds up getting key information on Russia's planes, which would no doubt pass on to its allies in NATO. With their limited capabilities, this means that using the Air Force might be a bigger risk than it's worth for Russia, especially since they have an alternative that does the same thing. Russia's assault on Ukraine has followed a simple pattern. They invade areas, try to conquer them, and then largely get run out of town by the better organized Ukrainian military. But when Ukraine wins the battle on the ground, the war doesn't end, because Russia then unleashes a barrage of long-range missiles from Russian territory designed to pound the population into submission. It hasn't worked, as the Ukrainian fighting spirit is as strong as ever, and President Volodymyr Zelensky has used the Russian atrocities to rally the world to Ukraine's defense. But it has worked to create a climate of fear in many Ukrainian cities, including Kyiv. While the bombing has lessened since the beginning of the war, it seems to step up whenever Putin suffers a humiliating loss, and unlike Air Force bombing raids, it's hard for Ukraine to retaliate. For now. In recent months, Ukraine has gotten bolder, not just striking back at Russian forces and weapon systems in Ukraine, but across the border. And as Ukraine gets closer to the border by taking back more regions that Putin had annexed, it becomes easier to hit Russian soil and their jets are far more effective and efficient than the Russian alternative, equipped with many of the same intelligence-gathering tools that NATO jets have. They don't have the numbers advantage. It's estimated that Russia has around 300 warplanes in range of Ukraine, while Ukraine only has around 100, but Ukraine is likely to win any air battle quite decisively, thanks to their support from anti-aircraft weapons on the ground. But numbers can be deceiving. Despite some grousing about the budget from Republicans, the odds are good that NATO and the United States will continue to supply Ukraine with the weapons it needs to fight off Russia for as long as possible. Russia, on the other hand, has only a finite domestic supply to draw from, and it's growing thinner and thinner. They also don't have a reliable source for new planes. Most of their allies, like Iran, don't have a strong air force, and China has been increasingly unwilling to commit to Putin's war which means that every plane Ukraine manages to strike down is one less Russia has in store for a bigger offensive. All this means that the Russian Air Force will not be providing the difference in the war. This makes you wonder, if Putin can't use his Air Force to win the war, what will he use instead? For more on Russia's military troubles, check out why Russia's only aircraft carrier sucks, or watch the huge problem stopping Russia from buying weapons instead.